I'm Michael Watts, and today I'm with one of the leading lights of British guitar making, Rory Dowling of Taran Guitars. Hello, Rory. Michael, great <laughs> to have you here. <laughs> Thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me. You'll see on my website a, a podcast interview that you can listen to, where Rory goes into some detail about the ethos and philosophy that goes into building these beautiful instruments, and also the, uh, the history of... Uh, Taran Guitars, which is now entering its 11th year. That's mm -hmm. yeah. We're also going to be looking at some uh, completed instruments today. You will find on my YouTube channel some recorded demo videos of those guitars too, but for this video we're just going to be talking uh, initially about the process itself. So Rory, um, you deal pretty much one-on-one -on -one with clients. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, each guitar is uh, imagined really from the ground up, yeah, isn't it? I suppose it? that's yeah. a good way of putting it, yeah. So once you have uh, established a, a client's needs and uh, selected the materials and specifications that's going to suit them, where do you begin? Well, I start with, I start by gluing the back together and getting that basic right. part of the instrument sorted out. And then from there, build the side unit. And while I'm making the side unit, the back's got time to relax. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things about my instruments is that I spend a lot of time letting the wood become accustomized to its new shape. Yes, of course. Um, so it always relaxed and uh, no nothing's ever forced together. So yeah, so the back will be, uh, this one we made earlier. Um, <laughs> so the back's glued together and then the braces are put on. Um, and you'll notice if I hold this up that the, uh, the back's cylindrical. So, yes, absolutely. There's a curve to it. Yeah, and uh, basically it goes into the go-bar deck with mm -hmm. braces glued on for, it can sit in there for anything up to a week. Really? Just so that yeah. it just allows it to relax and uh, yeah, it just becomes customised to its shape. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there the back will be tuned um, and then the side unit will be made by then and all of the uh, linings to be put on. It'll either be a double-sided guitar, um, right? Okay. Yeah. Or in this case, it'll be a single-sided guitar with uh, the laminated linings, solid mm -hmm. laminated linings, um, and then that part will go on. And once this part is done, I've got an idea of what what's happening with the instrument, mm -hmm. where we're where we're at, and then I'll start with the soundboard. Fantastic. So, and that's that's the next part. So I'd like to know what this is doing before I get to this point of course. because if I do this and then I don't know what's happening with this I mean, it kind of this is the engine <laughs> yeah, <absolutely. laughs> so yeah you don't you don't build the engine first in this case we're looking at uh, is it Malaysian blackwood this is Malaysian blackwood yeah and very quickly turning into one of my favorite well, I'm seeing a lot of it. Woods, yeah. you know, um, it's, it's definitely one of the knock-on effects of CITES. Mm -hmm. One of the things that really interests me about Malaysian Blackwood is that um, optically it can take on so many different patterns. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I was uh, going through the um, Holy Grail guitar show where, where you exhibited as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I'm normally okay at spotting words. <laughs> Uh, I think there are about six instruments. I was like, is that uh, Cambodian rosewood or Camatillo or, um, you know, could, could it be uh, Amazon rosewood? Every time it was, no, it's Malaysian blackwood. <laughs> I'm like, God oh, damn it. <laughs> and uh, it's one of the joys of it as well is that it's not a Dalberger, is it? It's not like no, uh, no. African blackwood. No, not at all. It is similar though. It does have that fundamental and very direct powerful tone to it mm. um, but it has more warmth behind it and, right. I, and I love it for that I just think it's fantastic for that um, I think you know it, it does visually takes on many many guises as you say um, but generally this is for me this is the kind of colour and uh, and certainly tonal palette that I'm looking for mm -hmm. when I buy Malaysian Blackwood um, yeah fantastic stuff I mean this particular guitar the client is looking for a, quite a focused instrument powerful obviously yeah. um, so but, and this is going to get a wenge neck on it um, really yeah oh, so wow. okay. and it really drives the focus of this instrument so um, you've got you know you've got a focused tone wood put a very very uh dense heavy neck on it and that focuses everything up again and when you do that with say african blackwood it can be 
it can almost be too steely. It's overpowering, you know? isn't it? Yeah. You get so, that real glassiness. Mm -hmm. it? Whereas with the Malaysian Blackwood, you get that subtle warmth in mm. below it. And I love that. I really, really like it. So using this more and more. So, yeah. And it does have a lot of the, the visual aspects of good Brazilian, doesn't it? You've got yeah. the, the, the mm -hmm. sort of spider webbing of it and then these sort of chocolate stripes to yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. It and it's got... It's a, you know it's got a, a holographic kind of effect yes, to it. it. In fact, mm -hmm. if you grab that one there, we'll maybe pull that one up. Yeah, absolutely. Show it under finish. So this is a kind of sister to this guitar. So Malaysian blackwood there, and you can yeah you can see the depth of the wood and mm. it's just beautiful stuff. And then again, this has got the wingy neck on it. This is the Chigger Beg. So mm -hmm. this is probably my most popular model. I built really? more of these than I think anything else. And you've described this as a sort of large OM. Yeah, I would say a large OM. I don't really follow the, um, the kind of Martin sizing. Sure. So they've, they've kind of developed over time and uh, yeah, this is this is the Mark II version of the uh, of the original. Mm -hmm. um, but still with the same philosophy, I want it to be quite a versatile instrument. Of course, um, yeah. So it's not uh, while I build for lots of different people and I can go very much down the finger style route mm. or down the accompaniment route yeah this is an instrument that is very well it is an instrument that is very versatile and mm -hmm. um, for all playing styles which is why it's so popular absolutely so and yeah. it's a very powerful guitar isn't it it's got a 16 inch low about and mm -hmm. Um, I've played both the, the sort of the finger style version as you put it yeah and yeah. the the real sort of plectrum uh, driven juggernaut and, and it's incredible just how uh, how different the personalities are you've got the same model and sometimes the same woods yeah yeah absolutely. and yet uh, so you've pulled so much out of the bracing and, and the voicing of the instrument it, yeah. it really is uh, it's amazing to see just how, how much versatility you can get out of the same box mm -hmm. this is a soundboard uh, it's very much in the rough at the moment mm -hmm. um, but the process thus far with this is is so uh, obviously book match this is a piece of European um, and I think I believe this is Swiss uh, and so glued together and then thickness down to oh, about 3.2 millimeters mm -hmm. uh, and then what I'll do from that point is cut the shape um, and then I'll, I'll hand tune it from there before the sound hole goes in, before anything else right. happens, I'll, okay. I'll thickness the top um, and listen to to what's happening and give it the the basic uh, response that I'm looking mm -hmm. for in the top. And this is Swiss Moon Spruce, isn't it? That yes, you've yeah. been using that quite a lot recently. Yeah, I've discovered. I used a, a lot of Italian spruce, and mm -hmm. I love that for the power, um, but. Uh, and then I used a lot of German and I loved the warmth in that <laughs> and I found the Swiss kind of it's got a bit of both bit, a bit, bit of both so I, yeah absolutely love it oh, it's, it's worth pointing out that that's actually the same genus of spruce they're just grown in different conditions so this bracing pattern mm -hmm. that we've got here Rory I'd say this was a sort of a a fan yeah you know I've got four different bracing patterns and I've also got uh, four different curvatures that I use and mix them all together right. to create what it is that the client's after. Uh, particular client, Chris, for this, he's looking for something with a very, very strong bass end, uh, right. bottom end to it. Um, so the fan ultimately allows, yeah. you know, allows for a more open bottom end. Mm -hmm. um, but then, <clears throat> excuse me, there's tuning on the plate before the braces go on hmm. that allow for the treble frequencies to be full and rich as well. I think one of the things as well is the, the response level that I like to work with, with people, mm -hmm. you know. And I suppose you heard that in um, from the Malaysian Blackwood Chigger Beg to this uh, Maple Taran. for the Holy Grail show um, and 
it was an experiment in detailing. Um, there's quite obvious influences in there. Uh, Michi and... Uh, certain was, Japanese yeah, chap, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Some little nods in that direction. Yes, so, and, um, but one of the key factors to this instrument is the back, and the, the major development of this is the, is the back. Mm. Um, we, through working with rosewoods and various other materials that are much denser and harder, you, you get an instrument that is, it's got, there's a richness to it, there's a ring, a liveliness to the mm. back. Whereas with a maple instrument, it can be lacking. So oh, absolutely, a yeah, tap tone, mm -hmm. you'd expect it to be fairly cardboardy. Yeah, right? absolutely. So, but with this, I increased the radius of the back, um, but made it very, very light. Um, mm. So it almost tightened it, but it gave it a ring, mm. and there's a, a richness and a power that you get from that. So, and I think it's well, you let you decide, but I think it comes through. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, and I'm seeing here a, a very beautiful take. A very subtle uh, forearm chamfer. Here. Yeah, I just, uh, just, I love small details, mm. things that you wouldn't really pick up until you hold something and Absolutely. feel it. Absolutely, because I've found with a lot of the, uh, the larger bevels, yes, there is um, a certain amount of, of comfort gained here in the, in the shoulder, and, and certainly on the on the forearm, mm -hmm. but it's often difficult to uh, keep hold of the instrument. You know, it can it can sort of squirt away from you, especially <laughs> if there's uh, a rib bevel as well. It's yeah, like a rugby yeah. ball, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I'm there trying to you know clamp it. Ninety percent of what I'm doing on stage is clamping the thing in place. Yeah, <laughs> and doesn't then, really give you oh, great freedom. <laughs> there's not a lot left. Now next up, here's this. We have another tarant. Another tarant. But again, another tarim, but very different again. Mm. Um, so this is uh, Madagascan rosewood. Oh, we've got um, some mad rose here in its yeah, natural state, haven't we? we? do. So this tarim is uh, it's quite very different from this, mm. as you know. Um, and um, it's not a rosewood that I've worked with a huge amount. Um, however, in a smaller instrument, I just absolutely love it. Mm. There's a glassiness that I really, really enjoy. Um, and yeah, beautiful stuff to work with. I've had this particular set in the workshop for, oh, James, about five or six years. Must be looking but, forward yeah, to it. Absolutely. <laughs> and the, on the run up to the Berlin show, I was sorting wood out in the uh, wood shop and basically I came across it and I literally was in here at 11 at night while well, I had all this other work on gluing this thing together because I just couldn't resist any longer. <laughs> now, this guitar has a very different character. Uh, it's a lot more um, bluesy mm -hmm. and, uh, and snappy than, mm -hmm. the, than the maple version. And in fact, for the, uh, for the video uh, demo, we actually strung this guitar with um, non-coated Daddario strings as opposed to the elixirs that I usually use. <laughs> really brought out its its woody uh, bluesy character mm -hmm. i think it's mm -hmm. a, an extraordinary instrument yeah a lot of compression on it as well mm, which yeah, is absolutely yeah really nice and this is detailed with rippled mahogany which you don't often see oh no there was um, me thinking that's that's really beautiful koa yeah <laughs> i reclaimed this uh from a violin maker who mm. had retired and he had this board sat in the corner of his workshop and he had wow. no idea what to do with it so i I know exactly what to do with it. <laughs> so, and then obviously we've got the, as with all of the guitars, the Robson tuners, mm, um, which yeah. are fantastic, absolutely lovely tuners, handmade down in England. Mm -hmm. So this top is Swiss as well, but it's got a bear claw to it, um, yes. which is just, yeah, lovely, lovely top. Um, really, really clean uh, annulars on it, uh, but with this bear claw on it. Mm. Now that Chigrebeg that we looked at, mm -hmm. um, it had a Wenge neck, yep. and we've got a Wenge blank here, and also the more commonly found mahogany. What have you found are the differences between these two uh, hardwoods sonically? Um, one of the things that I love about mahogany is that it gives you, obviously it gives you the strength 
and mm. the the lightness so that you've got an instrument that can breathe and uh, you'd be full in itself but one of the things I love about this stuff is that it focuses the sound and it really really adds a huge amount of power to the sound of an instrument mm. um, one of the things I've found so this is a uh, Brazilian mahogany this is reclaimed from a bank uh, Clydesdale bank this was a step in a Clydesdale bank of course it was yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> um, and but with bearing all of this in mind, looking at the density and the weight of necks and what that does to the sound of an instrument, mm. you can actually boil it down. And there's a piece of mahogany there just beside oh, right you, here. which is infinitely lighter than this. It is. So what you can do is, even with the mahoganies, you can change mm. the, the focus and the warmth and the breadth of the sound. So, yeah, neck material is massively important in in my in the work that I'm doing with with clients the other obviously next element of the neck is the uh, fretboard material right uh, yes and I use uh, predominantly ebony's um, but I've in kind of the last three years I was lucky enough actually to help develop the stuff which is great I did all the kind of oh, pre-testing and is all going. the rest <laughs> of it so and it is a product called rock light right um, it's basically veneers glued together under mm -hmm. ridiculously high pressures. So it is actually wood. Uh, it works like wood. It yeah. sounds like ebony. Um, mm -hmm. And it is a fantastic and really sustainable uh, alternative to ebony. I still offer ebony, obviously. Um, but I think looking forward, these kind of materials are going to be more and more prevalent in the in the guitar building industry and a lot of the uh, decorative aspects of your instrument uh, they come from natural materials as well yeah mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. in particular things like this is this buckeye that is burr elm from burr elm. yeah burr elm from a friend um in Ely. It was an Ely. He cut this uh, about 15 years ago mm -hmm. and it was given to me about a year before I built a, his best friend's guitar. Oh, wow. And one of the things we wanted to do was incorporate the the elm into the instrument. You can see the, the bevel there. And this, partic this particular one had a um, sand faded ends to it. Oh, so, right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so scorched with hot sand. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. So, yeah, really, really beautiful stuff. And it, it's local, and it's stunning, mm. you know, absolutely stunning. Usually it would be turned into bowls and a candle sticks and stuff, which is great. Yeah, it's but great. It's so but... nice to find another... It's not the same, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> One of the things that's most impressed me about the way that you work, Rory, is, is this really detailed... One-on-one uh, -on -one relationship that you you develop with with clients. What sort of musicians come to you looking for a, a taran guitar? Uh, I think people looking for something that's going to grow with them and mm. not hinder them. I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. And also, I think often clients are people who they they really they've searched and they've hunted and they they just can't find what they're looking for. So, and, and it's really those type of clients that have come that have enabled me to have this breadth of, of knowledge. Absolutely. Um, you yes. know, that's, they've really pushed me to, to learn mm. about these things. And, and I think, yeah, without them, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. So say a client uh, gets in touch with you for the first time. Uh, how do you prefer to be contacted and, and what sort of information is it useful for you to have from them? Uh, I mean, phone or email is absolutely grand. Um, I, I really like to know what they what they're playing, obviously, of course. Um, what they like, but probably more importantly, what they dislike. <laughs> yeah, of course. It's so you know, it's quite a negative starting block, but it gives me a, it gives me a much greater view of what it is that they're look hunting for but mm. also starts the conversation in a really honest way to, absolutely you know i've got this rule in the workshop i've said it to you this week <laughs> you know um you have to be honest because we're not going to get anywhere if you just say oh it's nice well rory thank you very much indeed it's a pleasure thank it's you a real joy brilliant mm.